Hello my dear friends, and welcome back to another Star Wars news update. Today we begin with something which is a surprise to be sure but a welcome one, and something which I really didn't expect to see this soon. What am I talking about? Star Wars have just given us our first major information about the new Jedi Order, the time period that the Rey movie is set in, 15 years after episode 9. Something which I'm curious about is the type of galaxy Rey is building her academy in. What does the galaxy look like a decade and a half after the Battle of Exegol? Nothing in the Star Wars galaxy is isolated, so what is the backdrop? And what is the reaction from the various corners which have been made aware of the resurgence of the Jedi Order? Not everyone is going to be too pleased about it. Which new threats have emerged? What kind of political systems are at play? And did the Sith return? In other words, my dear friends, what is the Jedi Master? And yes, she is a Jedi Master at this time, and her Padawans contending with, what are they up against? Well, as I say, a new tidbit, a new piece of interconnected information, has given us something of our first glimpse. A sample for the upcoming book, The Rise and Fall of the Galactic Empire by Chris Kempshaw, has actually given us a very interesting perspective from this time period, from the point of view of the character Beaumont Kin. And this is so exciting. I'm by no means the biggest sequels fan in the world, but I'm so curious about what happens next. I wasn't majorly impressed with The Rise of Skywalker and you guys know it's one of my least favourite Star Wars films, but after the scene with Rey on Tatooine, igniting the Yellow Saber, I had tons of questions. And for years until the Rey movie was announced as Celebration last year, fans thought that was it. So to finally be getting answers whether you love the sequels or you don't, is definitely something that a lot of fans are going to be curious about. And so the upcoming book says this, The assumption, my dear friends, is that the Resistance have formed a new government. And this new authority has gathered Palpatine's data from the remains of the Battle of Exegol. Here is the quote. Understandings of the past change. The details that have been retrieved from both the Archives of the Empire and the First Order can, when combined with the new material being uncovered on Exegol, help tell a different story about the Clone Wars. So this resistance movement, which has more power now than ever before, because they're kind of the new government of the galaxy, is trying to understand what's come before in the past, but I also think, and this is just me speculating, they might come across traces of evidence that some of Palpatine's loyalists, the Sith Eternal, survived and scattered to other parts of the galaxy. Are they going to try and clone Palpatine again, or maybe try to revive a different Sith? Maybe alongside the birth of Rey's Jedi Order, there is a new Sith Order that emerges in the shadows. In either case, my dear friends, they should not revive Palpatine, we don't need the same villain again. And the most intriguing part of Rey being up against a new Sith is the fact that she has Palpatine's blood. And this could be an ongoing theme, the Sith Eternal continuously trying to lure Rey to the dark side, and still believing she is the true Empress and heir to Palpatine's throne. And to this point, is Rey now entirely devoid of dark side tendencies? Or does she still have a struggle between light and dark? Is that temptation going to return? I mean, probably not. That would more or less undo the entire point of episode 9, Rey rejecting her evil bloodline as a Palpatine and instead adopting and continuing the Skywalker name as a Jedi. I guess a part of me is just very disappointed they didn't do more with Dark Side Rey. I thought the concept itself was just awesome. There are endless possibilities, but this, my dear friends, is our first official glimpse at this time period the post-Rise of Skywalker galaxy. And this really surprised me because my assumption was that this book was just the rise and rule of the Empire, not what came after it. And this tells me maybe Dr. Chris Kemshaw was told to give us our first little nuggets of information after episode 9, and this could in many ways set the precedent for Rey's movie. And in case you're wondering, this book releases on July 4th. And in terms of updates for the Rey movie itself, in a new interview with Empire Magazine, Daisy revealed she is reading a script, quote, next month. But she might be talking about this month because it's relative to when the interview took place, and it is possible that while this issue just came out, the interview is from a month ago. But remember, my dear friends, it might be some time until this movie makes it to the big screen. The Mandalorian and Grogu is confirmed to be the first of the two movies releasing in 2026. And even though the Rise of Skywalker saw Rey and the Resistance emerge victorious, the resolution to the First Order Resistance War left many questions unanswered, especially since the galaxy has gone through this before. Return of the Jedi ended in Palpatine's first death, the victory of the Rebellion against the Galactic Empire, and the birth of a new Republic. But soon enough, the victories didn't last long. As we see in shows like The Mandalorian, Ahsoka, Book of Boba Fett, there is an Imperial remnant that is going to become the First Order. And so later in the timeline, after the First Order is defeated, there could be a resurgence in the form of an offshoot, a cultish group, or a faction that keeps the philosophies and ideals of the First Order alive. 
As I mentioned, this could be a new version of the Sitha Tunnel. And just imagine if the movie gives us an archaeological excavation of Exegol. That could be really dark, and bring to it the horror vibes I've been clamoring for for years. The beginning of episode 9 when Kylo Ren finds Exegol, goes into the temple, we see the massive Sith statues, and we hear Palpatine's voice. At last, Snoke trained you well, my boy. I made Snoke. I've been very critical of the way they treated Palpatine in that movie and I think, looking back there were some pretty poor decisions, but in that moment, at the start of the movie I thought that was one of the most epic things we'd seen in the sequel trilogy. But anyway, I digress. Before I move on, I want to ask you guys, what kind of villain do you want to see in the upcoming Rey movie? Should it be another Sith? Should it be a crime syndicate? Should it be a different force group? Let me know. But moving on my dear friends, I just want to finish by talking just a little bit about the upcoming video game that many fans are talking about at the moment, Star Wars Outlaws, and I did make a video talking about the return of Kira just a couple of days ago. But just like the Acolyte trailer, the trailer for this game is being absolutely ratioed. For an open world Star Wars game, fans are pretty upset at Ubisoft's direction, not to mention the stilted dialogue, and some have found that while the graphics are pretty decent, I would say they're pretty good, the facial animations are pretty wooden. I was reading a review by Forbes and they were saying that this is simply a game masquerading as a Star Wars title, but it's not. When it comes to criticism about the dialogue, it's also criticism about the very simplistic mission, running away from a syndicate you crossed. And I think looking at this trailer, I do kind of see this perspective, but I also think the game's strength could come in the form of the various planets, the world building, the open world nature of it. I also think the storyline in this time period to many fans is not very interesting, but I guess as someone who really enjoyed the War of the Bounty Hunters comics, as well as the Kira trilogy, I'm really here for some of the plot points, for some tie-ins on a more visual level than just comics, the cutscenes and the overall narrative. And all of the aforementioned criticism isn't even taking into account the financial and monetization strategy that Ubisoft have once again decided to employ. The standard edition is $69.99, but if you want the ultimate edition, that is going to set you back 130 bucks. And as the gamer.com say, there is never a good reason for single player games to have season passes. And Ubisoft have often been the worst defenders of this practice. The past decade has seen it put out standard, gold, and ultimate editions for the majority of its games, each of them with heinous pricing structures. And the worst part about this is the fact if you want the Jabba the Hutt mission, Jabba's Gambit, you have to pay the higher price. But what do you think? Are you going to be picking up this game? Let me know down below and share your thoughts on everything we spoke about. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give me a big fat thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. May the Force be with you, always.